Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ingemar Church. My name is David Streets. I'm one of the pastors here at Ingemar Church, along with Greg Cox and Dennis Henley. If this is the first time that you are joining us for worship today, we're so excited that you have joined us. You are an answer to our prayers. We have been praying consistently for you to join us. So thank you for being here today. If you have not yet had an opportunity to complete a Connect card, we encourage you to do so at the conclusion of our service today. Now, hear these words from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And now, let us join together with Laura and Josh as we worship God together. Yes, good morning and welcome to Ingemar. From wherever you are, won't you join us as we praise Jesus together? This heart open wide from the depths, from the heights, I will bring a sacrifice. With these hands lifted high, hear my song, hear my cry, I will bring a sacrifice. I will bring a sacrifice. I lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down. Whoa, hand on my heart, this much is true. There's no life. Life and let it shine, shine, shine. Take this life and let it shine. Oh, hand on my heart, this much is 
Your love never fails me. 
loving God, where can we go that you are not with us? If we ascend to heaven, you are there. If we make our bed in the depths, you are there. If we perceive the darkness overwhelming us, we know that even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. The darkness is as light to you. You hem us in. You lay your hand upon us. And when we come to the end, you are still with us. Hear our requests and petitions as we bring them before you in this moment of silent prayer. God, in your wisdom, you have created us and given us many gifts. And today we thank you for all that we mean to each other and to our friends and families. We thank you for the love that has brought us to this time and place and for your love, which abides to tie us all together. Where you are, O oh God, there is love. So now as our Savior Christ taught us, we are bold to say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Psalm 27, 6 says in part, I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Our time of offering from week to week, whether we are gathered in a sanctuary or participating at home through media, is a time of joyfully recognizing the blessings God has provided for us. That is especially important in this time that seems so frustrating and, and discouraging. Many are sidelined from their work. Some are unsure as to how they're going to pay their bills. And everyone feels isolated and restricted. Yet through thankful giving, we do experience joy. And we find much for which to be thankful to God. James 1.17 tells us, every good and perfect gift is from above. Our offerings are a way of acknowledging the blessings that God has given to us continually. While it's very easy for us to look on the dark side of things in the present day, there is so much good supplied to us by Almighty God, not the least of which is the assurance of salvation given to us through Jesus Christ. Our offerings are not a means of paying God for anything, but serve to remind us of God's goodness to us and our gratitude for all with which we are blessed. Our offerings care for a lot of things. Some are obvious, such as meeting the day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week expenses of the church. Some go to places that perhaps we don't know very much about or have direct contact, but where needs are met and lives are changed in the name of Jesus because of your generosity. So I would invite you today to joyfully take part in this time of offering. You can do that electronically online or by mail to the church office. Additionally, if you'd like to help with some of the local needs that exist in our surrounding community, you can drop off non-perishable items at the entrance A of the Community Life Center at the church between the hours of 9 and noon from Monday to Friday, where you'll find a collection box. Please join me for a moment of prayer for our offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the good gifts you provide for us. We thank you for family, for friends, for church, for opportunities to serve and be served. We thank you for the material blessings of life and especially for those which are spiritual and eternal. Please receive the gifts we bring to offer you this day and may our lives honor you as well as others through our day-to-day -day encounters with those that we meet from day to day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Our scripture lessons for today comes from the book of James and also from the book of Ephesians. Let me begin with Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast And now turning to James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. May the Lord add his blessing to these readings and to our further understanding of his holy word. Amen. While I was serving in my very first church, My wife, Tony, and our then-infant son, David, and I were invited to someone's home for dinner. Jim and Jane were very active in our church. Jim was on the finance committee, and Jane was active in our children's ministry and led a Bible study. Jane was a great cook. I knew that from our church dinners. Her ethnic heritage was Polish. So she had some really fine old world recipes. I was looking forward to what awaited us, and Jane did not disappoint us. I hope you like stuffed cabbage, Jane said. This is my grandmother's recipe. Now I know what you are thinking. Stuffed cabbage? Really? You just take ground meat and rice and you wrap them in cabbage and you add sauerkraut and some tomato sauce. Yeah, they're good. But do you really serve them to company? Yeah. Well, these were not those stuffed cabbages. Jane, these are wonderful, I said. They contained ground beef and rice and ground kielbasa and bacon sliced and chopped onion, sauerkraut, they were wrapped in cabbage, cooked in butter, and tomato sauce. They were out of this world. They were to die for, and I'm pretty convinced that if you ate enough of them, often enough, you would die from them, or because of them, of a heart attack. Wow, they were that good. After dinner and over dessert, which was awesome as well, we began to talk about church life. We talked about the Bible and being a Christian. We discussed sin and forgiveness. And I shared with them at one point what Paul had written in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. I went on to explain as part of our conversation that we are all sinners. Jane had a problem with that. She said, I agree that everyone sins. I agree that no one is perfect. I admit that I sometimes sin, but I am not a sinner, she insisted. So I read for her the rest of the verse. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace 
through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Basically, we are all sinners, and we can all be forgiven for our sins through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. But we have a problem sometimes being lumped together with all sinners, especially the most severe ones, right? Well, today we are continuing with our series of messages that is our attempt to answer some of your burning questions. Today we are going to consider grace and legalism and faith and works. Here are the two questions that we will consider, and then we will address each of them one by one. Question number one. Does our church overemphasize legalism rather than grace we receive from being saved? Question number two. What is the role that works has in the life of a Christian in relating to the grace that we've been given? In other words, after we've been given grace, do we then need to do works to keep or ensure our place and our grace? Two pretty good, pretty complex questions. Let's begin with the first one. Again, does our church ever emphasize Excuse me, does our church ever overemphasize legalism rather than the grace that we receive from being saved? This is a question that requires a judgment. I think the question is asking do we ever overemphasize following rules or laws or teachings at the expense of extending grace to others? Since I have served as the senior pastor for the past 14 years, I would say that I hope we don't. But I would also admit that there probably are times when we do. I don't think we are a perfect church that never, ever makes any mistakes. In all honesty, it is never my intention to deny someone grace. And we do not intentionally deny grace in favor of legalism. But it's possible that we may have done so. So let's consider some of the definitions in our phrasing. Grace is God's free, unearned love. Grace is God's love that you don't deserve. You didn't do anything to make God extend his love to you. God just did it. You are loved by God not because you did a bunch of good stuff or because you gave a bunch of money to a good cause. You are loved by God because you are. You are a child in God's family. You are a member of God's creation. It's kind of like the way our parents love us. They love us because we were born to them. They love us because we belong to them. It's like that with God, only better. When all else fails, God still loves us, and God always will. Legalism. Legalism is strict, literal adherence to law. One source defined legalism from a theological perspective, saying that it is dependence on moral law rather than on personal religious faith. Now let me ask you, why do we have rules and laws? We have rules and laws to bring order to society. They help us to relate to one another and to live in close proximity to each other in a civil fashion without violating each other's rights. They help us to promote a safe, protective environment. Obeying those rules and laws are an expectation for all of those who live in society. Why do we have commandments? Wasn't it God's idea? Commandments were given to God's people to help them to be able to do life together. God had led them out of slavery in Egypt and into the wilderness. They lived in tents in close proximity to one another. They needed to love God first and foremost. 
They couldn't have people dishonoring their parents, making up lies and accusations about one another. They couldn't allow for people to steal from each other, to violate one another's marriages. God's laws, in that case, brought order to society and enabled them to live together in harmony. Jesus' teachings and instructions were intended to help us to experience the best that life has to offer, life in all its fullness, according to how Jesus defines fullness. After all, Jesus was there at creation. He, was, he designed and created us. He knows what's best for us. Sometimes rule following can be overemphasized at the expense of grace, and that's legalism. Jesus spoke against legalism when he confronted the Pharisees. They were legalistic. They had a very weak, if any, understanding of God's grace at all. They worked hard to maintain their observance of law and religion. They often focused on how well they were following the rules that had been laid out before them. Likewise, they often called attention to others who were not as good at following the rules. In so doing, the Pharisees made others feel like they weren't as important to God and that they weren't as loved by God as were the Pharisees. But we know, we know that God loves all of his creation. Do you remember the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector? It goes like this, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to a temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up at heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalted themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let me ask you, have you ever done something similar? Of course, you didn't go up to the temple to pray like that. But have you ever compared yourself to someone that you perceived is not as good as you are as a way for you to make yourself look better? Have you ever been eager to point out the flaw in someone else's character or behavior in a way that helps to elevate your own understanding of yourself? Because I think we all do that at some time or another. Jesus had something to say about that as well in Luke chapter 6. How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Here's the point. We are all sinners. God loves each one of us. God wants a relationship with each of us, a relationship that he makes available to each and every one of us by his grace, his free unearned love through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. As individual followers and believers in Jesus, and as a church, it is our responsibility to bring people to that place where they understand and embrace God's love for them. It is not to drive them away. God loves all of us equally, all of us. But we also, we also seek to obey God's laws, Jesus' teachings and his instructions in order for us and for others to experience the fullness of of God's grace. Question number two, what is the role that works have in the life of a Christian 
relating to grace that we've been given. In other words, after we've been given grace, then do we need to do works to keep or ensure our place and grace? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how deeply you have delved into sin or how despicable your sins may have been. Jesus died for you. God wants to forgive you, and God wants to have a relationship with you. God wants to do life with you. John writes, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter who you are or what you have done, if we turn to Jesus, it is as if our lives are like sin-stained rags that have been dipped in the blood of Jesus and come out whiter than snow. That's the image in the hymn where we sing, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You receive salvation and the promise of eternal life through the death and resurrection of Jesus through God's grace, his free, unearned love, because you believe in Jesus and what he's done for you. Paul writes, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, Listen to it again in the Amplified Version. From time to time, we talk about different versions of Scripture, and the Amplified Version has the, has the, is able to um, explode the verse for us, if you will, to give us more understanding of what we're, reading, what we're reading. So listen to it in the Amplified Version. For it is by grace, which is God's remarkable compassion and favor drawing you to Christ, that you have been saved actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort, but it is the undeserved and gracious gift of God, not as a result of your works, nor your attempts to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for their salvation. We don't earn our salvation. We don't do stuff, good stuff, to gain our admittance to heaven. When Paul and Silas were released from prison miraculously, the jailer fell on his knees in front of them and said, What must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Salvation is a gift. It is free as a result of God's love for us, it doesn't come to us through our works. So then, so then where does works come into play? Listen carefully. Good works or good deeds are an expression of our faith in God and our love for God. Let me say that again. Good works or good deeds are an expression of our faith in God and our love for God. When we accept the work that God has done on our behalf, the gift of his son who lived and died for us, we are overwhelmed and our lives are transformed, right? We say to ourselves, really? God would love even me in the midst of all that I have done? And we are grateful. We are so grateful. And it's that gratitude and our corresponding love for God which leads us to want to do what God wants us to do. Our appreciation for what God has done leads us to be concerned for what is best for others. Our joy that comes from being confident of God's love for us leads us to want others to experience the joy of salvation. Our love for God, because he first loved us, motivates us to be active, to relieve hunger and thirst, illness and disease, poverty, injustice and suffering, 
and to demonstrate our love for others. James writes, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith without, without action is dead. For John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church movement, faith or belief and good works or deeds are united in God's love. God expresses his love for us in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ and we, in turn, express our response to God's love through our good deeds, particularly toward those in need. Wesley identifies God's love in action as works of mercy. These works of mercy are our intentional practice of loving our neighbor through our deeds and our, and our identification with our neighbor's needs. Good deeds or works are a natural response to God's love for us. I do not believe that doing good works keeps or ensures our place in God's kingdom or enables us to hang on to that grace that we've experienced, that we've originally received from God, but they do function, they do function as an expression of our faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I believe that doing good things, performing works of service to others, demonstrates that our acceptance of God's love and the saving work of Jesus was and is genuine in us. It took root in us. It is transforming us and it is leading us to be more like Jesus. Doing good works shows us and others that we love God and we love our neighbor. It proves that something in us has changed, that we are drawing closer to God through Christ. Remember, remember how dramatically Zacchaeus changed after he met Jesus? If we refuse to do good deeds, if we have no desire to give of our time or our money or our gifts or our abilities to help others, then I think we must ask ourselves if we really have faith in God, if we really do love God, and if we really love Jesus and our neighbor. And I think that's what James meant when he said, faith without works is dead. True believers... Genuine believers should want to do good deeds. Good deeds are evidence of our faith in God. Good works prove that our acceptance of God's grace into our lives was real. When we do good things, when we do good works, we are trying to be more like Jesus in a world of need. Now, let me ask you to give your attention to these next steps. We talked about an awful lot of things this morning, and, um, and I want to make sure that we touch on several points. First of all, some of you may be hearing for the very first time about the grace of God and the, author, and the offer of salvation. And if you would like to respond to God's grace for you, then I would like to invite you to pray with me this prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus... Thank you for what you have done for me. Thank you for your love. I accept your sacrifice for me, and I want to love and follow you from this day forward. Assure me, remind me of your forgiveness in my life, and grant, O oh God, that we may walk together. In your name we pray. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer today, um, I encourage you to tell someone. 
you can let us know at the church. You can contact any one of us at Ingemar Church. We would be glad to be able to respond to you about that. I'd like to encourage you today to memorize two passages of Scripture. They're the main ones from our message today. It's not a lot to memorize, and they're both very, very important. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not by works, so that no one can boast. The second thing is James chapter 2, verse 17. Faith without works is dead. And then continuing through the theme of the message, ask yourself, do I ever compare myself to others, thinking that I am better than others, perhaps loved by God more than God love others? Second thing, am I aware that God loves everyone unconditionally, even me? And third, am I doing good deeds and works of service to others as an expression of my love for God? Will you pray with me, please? Gracious God, we give you thanks for your love for us, for how you have accepted us just as we are, and how it is your desire to enable us to experience life in all of its fullness, that you have given us guidelines, you have given us directions so that you might encourage us and lead us along a path so that we might experience all that you have in store for us. Oh God, help us to not think more highly of ourselves than others. Help us to be grateful for the grace you've given us. And help us, God, to desire to serve others to serve others as a way of serving you, meeting their needs, demonstrating our love for them as an expression of our love for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Why don't you join us as we sing of the grace of God as a response, as our final thing that we do together this morning. Let's sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
So may the God of grace keep you in his love this day. When you stumble, may you find hope and restoration in his name. When you lose hope, may you find solace. When you're impatient and anxious, cast your cares on him and receive his comfort. Walk with Jesus this week and know that he's right there with you. Thanks for joining us. So go in peace and we'll see you next week.